I have a good friend named Cindy, and she's a marketing specialist. She often meets her clients at a coffee shop, and during one of these meetings, a random man came up to her to introduce himself. One of those, hi, I'm Mark, I couldn't help overhearing introductions. Mark had a startup, he needed some help, so Cindy gave him her business card, and she forgot all about the encounter. Mark, however, did not. Mark used that business card with her name, phone number, and email to learn way more about Cindy than she could ever imagine. A few clicks online, and Mark was able to find out how old Cindy was, where she lived, who she was married to, even who her friends were. Worse, Mark started to follow her. He could see everywhere she went, and heard everything she said. And Mark shared all this information with his coworkers and his business partners, and he let them share on and on. And he kept all this detail forever, and Cindy had no idea. Now, I know what you might be thinking. This is kind of creepy, or uh, there's no way this is legal, or maybe you're just thinking, I really need to change my business card. But guess what? Mark's last name is Zuckerberg, and we're all Cindy. <laughs> Nearly 30 years ago, an Englishman named Tim Berners-Lee created what would become the World Wide Web to help people easily locate and share information on the internet. Not since the advent of the printing press have more people been connected to each other, to worlds beyond their own, and to more opportunities. But since that noble beginning, the web as we know it has evolved from a decentralized platform for knowledge, communication, and commerce, controlled by no one person or party, to a tool some even say a weapon, deployed by a select few technology giants, political extremists, and motivated governments, all in an effort to control, manage, and manipulate the very people it was intended to serve. Now you might be asking, how do I know that? Because I made technology to help them do it. You see, I think we can all agree, in part thanks to the web, that we live in a world where we enjoy instant access to goods, services, and endless entertainment. Yet somehow, ironically, we've never been more miserable, more angry, and more unhealthy. Now, why is that? I want to propose a very simple answer, and it's that our digital world does not square with our analog experience. Now, when I say digital, I just mean all the things we do with the help of the internet. Selling on Craigslist, grabbing an Uber, paying a bill online. And when I say analog, I just mean the things we don't need the internet for. Having coffee, walking the dog, almost everything we do without our phones. Unfortunately, the way we are naturally, in person and offline, simply isn't permitted in the digital space. And this oversharing and overexposure, conscious on some levels and unconscious on others, has left us feeling vulnerable. And that vulnerability, that loss of control and freedom has left us searching for meaning, substance, and security in an intrusive and unsafe digital world. Now, don't take my word for it. In 2016, Pew Research conducted a study, and over 91% of Americans agreed that they had lost control of their personal and private information. Almost as many expressed grave doubt about the security and privacy of their everyday communications. But I think most disturbing is nine out of 10 people 
expressed a significant lack of confidence in institutions, public or private. Now, I have been concerned about this problem for, for quite some time, in part because I contributed to it, but in part because it's not hard to look around, read the news, and see this anger and distrust everywhere we look. But somewhere along the way to this Orwellian future, I found an answer, and I want to describe it for you, a way to bring back the original intent of the internet. You see, each of us has a level of control over our private moments. Looking out, I can see your faces, in part thanks to the glow of your smartphones. <laughs> but I don't know your names. I can see your expressions, but I don't know what you're thinking, where you live, how you voted. You're there, I'm here, and you're listening to me right now. At least I hope you are. But while we're separate individuals, we're also social creatures. And evolutionary biology tells us that we're wired, our, our physical and emotional survival is based on the communities and relationships we invest and build. And we're wired to constantly filter, manage, and tailor our behavior, our speech, even our attire to the various contexts and circumstances in which we find ourselves. Home, school, work, your church, my bar. This compartmentalization is a natural, normal, evolved human behavior, and it comes from the fight, flight, or freeze reflex. It's served us well for thousands of years, and yet it's impossible to do online. Think about that for a minute. The digital world literally contradicts our biology. In that world, the world of today, Regardless of the site or service, we are constantly compelled to have a single permanent identity whose digits are used to track us forever. All these tattoos tell our digital despots way too much about us. And worse, these bits of digital exhaust are shared with and without our consent by organizations we once trusted to do unknown things. Things that make tracking, profiling, and manipulating us easier for those companies, and governments in some cases, to exert their power and control over us. All, without our real consent, and actual control. Now, history and biology also tell us we were never meant to be watched 24-7 or tracked moment to moment certainly never meant to be fed an infinite scroll of images and videos designed to consume and dominate our attention. That's why we have curtains in our windows, locks on our doors, and an off button on the television. We use these things to protect ourselves, to control our environments, and to keep us safe. Now, I have a confession to make. I used to run a company that built surveillance software. That software was like a digital video recorder, and we built it for large companies you know and the three-letter agencies you read about, even some you haven't. And while we helped protect those organizations, we also contributed to the public-private partnership of data mining. Now, in some cases, to track down bad guys, and in other cases, to uncover fraud. But regrettably, in way too many cases, simply to support the digital voyeurism of those in power. People were humiliated, some were even fired, or worse, and I bet you've read about a few. You see, unfortunately, over time, those cameras facing outward, looking for hackers and bad actors, were turned inward on you. And that was a big problem for me. 
Now, the 2016 election and Facebook's recent scandals have brought these issues front and center. Fake news, countless data breaches, and the endless exploitation of our personal information have unfortunately become an everyday occurrence. But unlike any time in recent history, people are starting to become aware of these dangers and many are taking action. In Facebook's case, 250 million people or a group the size of the adult population of the United States deleted their accounts and many more have dramatically reduced their use of social media. And they're not alone. All kinds of people are taking back ownership and control of the things that matter most to them without asking for permission and certainly without accepting the incomprehensible and unfair terms of service that we face day in and day out. Now, some say it's a movement, maybe even a revolution, where the number one goal is cutting out the intermediary, the gatekeeper, and the central authority. Netflix and Amazon are cutting out the cable cartels. DoorDash and Grubhub have changed the way we dine. But the most important of these movements is Bitcoin. Now, certainly a way to cut out the banks. That's not why. You see, the engine that drives Bitcoin is powering numerous efforts beyond finance to shift the balance of power back to the individual. And that engine is called the blockchain. For the first time in human history, all of us have equal, unfiltered access to a truthful, transparent, incorruptible platform controlled by no one where we can decide what information is stored, accessed, and shared. No middlemen, no toll takers, no opinion shapers. Now, before I move on, I just want to take a minute and try to explain the concept of blockchain. And I'm going to leave out a lot of technical details, in part because they're super technical, but mostly because I don't want to put you to sleep. I'd like you to think of the blockchain as a book. Imagine this book being reproduced all over the world so anyone can have access. The book has a table of contents, words, pictures, footnotes, and the like, and each page is sequentially numbered. All of us can be authors of new content, and when that content is added to the book, it can never be modified or shared without that author's consent. When a new entry is made, it's spell-checked, and then it's printed to the next new page, and then all the books in existence automatically update so that if one is destroyed, there's always a record. That's it. That's all it is. Yes, there's some math involved, which folks like to call cryptography, and there really are significant te technical challenges to address. But all you need to know is that this blockchain technology, this book, is taking power and control away from the data miners and putting freedom, choice, and privacy back to you. Publish anything in that book you want. Author it with your legal name, your nickname, your pseudoname. The book gives you the ability to decide which pieces of information you want to publish. Instead of one big, faceless, careless author controlling our digital destiny, all of us get to be that author. It can really be that easy. Imagine. Cindy could control the various details Mark gets. She could even create various business cards, each for different facets of her digital life. And with that kind of control, she can rest assured that any random encounter with a creep like Mark uh, <laughs> won't lead to creepy outcomes, dangerous stalking, or worse, 
congressional hearings. <laughs> In the offline world, all of us have control over our personal safety. You might, for example, choose not to walk down a dark alley at night. But in the online world, you don't even know where those dark alleys are. The blockchain shines a spotlight on all of that, an open book that by design lends itself to visibility, trust, and control. And that's the problem with today's internet. We've ceded control, knowingly or not, to powerful companies and big governments. We all know and feel this. And that feeling, that loss of freedom, has led us searching for safety in our respective tribes. Instead of having the difficult conversations and trying to solve the hard problems that we all face, we're all left neatly segmented by our identity, gender, geography, and politics, by the monopolies that profit from our digital lives. The way to fix this starts by living online the way we already do offline. The blockchain will give us the power to create, curate, and control all of our personal information in ways that are natural and instinctive, the way we're biologically wired to do so. And when we square our digital realities with our analog lives, we will not only be taking back control as individuals, we will be creating a safer, more authentic, truly connected world. A world where each of us gets to define our terms of service and not the other way around. Thank you. <laughs>